Yeah, my youngest wanted everyone to know that he bought that. Of course, he used my debit card, I believe, so <laughs> I don't think that counts. <laughs> well, I forgot my button. I use that phrase a lot, man, myth, legend, and um, I don't know where I got that from. I know people say it all the time, but I always think it's a great phrase. I, I use it of older people who, um, you know, a lot of times people, as they get older, they kind of think people are forgetting about us, and I always think that we should remind people that, especially older people, that they have purpose, so... Um, a lot of times when I talk to Greg or, you know, someone else on the phone, some, some old guy, I like, to, I like to say man, myth, legend. So anyways, this is, uh, if I had a desk, this would be, you know, people who are going to watch this video later aren't going to know what we're talking about. Anyway, so Zeke handcrafted that for me in China. Okay, so we're going to look through the Proverbs this morning. Um, we're just, you know, it's kind of hard to label the lessons because they're all, it's just, it's various Proverbs. It's just sort of random. Um, but I, I do want you to just sort of think about, um, on Wednesday we talked about the wise and the foolish. Today we're going to talk about pro Proverbs that have to do more with the issue of good and evil. Um, <coughs> a sort of interesting thing has happened in the last few years, maybe 10 years, where, and, and it's always been true, where people have denied um, facts of history, or history has been rewritten, and what's happened more recently, um, in the last 10 years or so, is the, the denial of the Holocaust, and which I find fascinating, because the, doc, you know, the documentation, the, you know, Docu documentaries, the photos, the videos, the interviews, it's an absolute undeniable fact of history. And why do we get to a point as a people where we start to deny things that happened in the past? It's sort of like what's happening right now in our country with the expressions of wokeism, where everything has to be denied. The reality is that's who we were. And things have changed. And the, the simple idea that this is our history doesn't have to be offensive. It should be a thing to learn from. And what I find interesting in the Proverbs is that a lot of what happens is um, good and evil are presented in a way that you can understand long consequence, not just consequence of things that are happening in the immediate future, but things that will happen uh, eventually. Good to see y'all, Whirlies. Good to be seen, yes. If you didn't notice, uh, Miss Bryant's over here too. She hasn't been here in a while. It's good to see her. And of course, Doyle's back. Tracy texted me this morning. She said she's been out of pocket for a while, but we've seen her recently, so it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we've all converted to Presbyterianism, um, okay, that's not really that funny, but okay. Anyway, so what you find in the Proverbs is a discussion of good and evil um, from a moral standpoint. So in Old Testament history, the way pr good and evil are discussed is simply as God's law. This goes against God's law. This is something that God's law supports. One of the things that I found fascinating last year as we studied the Torah was how much of the text is dedicated to what we would call humanitarianism, the idea of taking care of the people who are around us. And it's a good percentage. I don't know what that percentage is, but I'm going to guess it's in the 20 to 30 percent of the text is fully written to tell us Take care of people who are disadvantaged, people who are sick, people who don't have money, people who um, don't uh, are handicapped, don't have the ability to plow fields, don't have the ability to gather in crops. You take care of, and so it's it's not a governmental responsibility; it's an individual responsibility, and that's one of the things that the law of Moses teaches. 
So from a moral perspective, what we need to see is how does that become real? How is it, how is it actualized in our lives? Well, obviously, we do some of that collectively. The church can take in money and it can take care of the needs of people who, you know, are around us, whether within the church or outside of the church. And I think we should be doing that kind of thing. But it really lies on individuals to notice the needs of the people around us. So in a very true sense, our morality is very much like our evangelism. Evan the, the church's objective in evangelism is to teach. And, and we want to bring people to the Lord. At the same time, most of the responsibility of evangelism doesn't rest on the church as a corporate body. It rests on individuals. It's up to you. I don't know the people in your circles. And you don't know the people in mine. It's up to each one of us to interact with the people in our circles to, to show them the life of Christ through our own lives. As well, from a moral responsibility, it's up to us to teach people who Christ is by the, by the way that we deal with others. So when people are hurting, who should they be looking to? Who should find the solutions? Who should um, solve the problem for them? It should be believers. And what Proverbs is doing is it's putting the onus on believers. And it's saying it matters how you talk. It matters the way that you think. And, and if that was never true back, if it was never understood back then, Jesus certainly changes the way people understand that by his time. So let's start. We're going to, if you've got your uh, daily Bible, the chronological one that we're reading, we're going to be, we're going to start on page 628. If you don't have that and you just have uh, a, a normal Bible, we're going to go to Proverbs 12. We'll be kind of skipping around through the Proverbs. That's one of the reasons that if you have the daily Bible, I'd like for you to bring it. Um, because it's a little harder for me to remember to tell you where we are each time. I'll try to do a decent job of that. There are basically at this point in the Proverbs, what he starts listing are Proverbs that have to do with good and evil. One of the reasons that people want to deny the Holocaust is they don't want to look at it. They don't want to think about it. And I know there are lots of other reasons for it, but one of the things that we struggle against is our own history and who we have been. And you can say all day, that's not who I was. Sure, understood. And at the, and at the same time, humanity has been these things. And entire groups of people throughout history have been swayed by the persuasiveness of one person or by the dialect of one person to do atrocious things. And um, I, li I like the history of World War II um, and I hate to say that, but I, but I am fascinated by World War II. And I don't think that it's something that has to be an isolated incident in history. And I don't think that it is. We can find other atrocities, and those things will flare back up again. It is part of being human that people want to hurt other people, that people want to have power over other people. And if you don't recognize that, what the Proverbs is trying to say is you have to stand apart from the world. The world is all about how you mistreat other people. And you as a believer, you have to stand in contrast to that. You have to treat people with respect and honor. And, and listen to the statements that we'll see this morning about how you treat the poor. One of the most fascinating ones in our readings for today was about people who mock the poor. That they don't, they don't have a relationship with God. They don't understand their own maker. And I think we as a group of believers, we have to stand in very stark contrast to the people of the world. You don't do that because you gather together on Sunday morning and uphold a you know, set of beliefs that have no deference in your life. The way you stand apart from the world is that what we do today challenges us for this week and we behave differently than we did last. The way the world recognizes Christ living in us is that you walk out, I walk out of here today determined to live differently, to live the principles that we find in Proverbs. As I said last week, Proverbs is about where the rubber meets the road. 
So you can talk all day long last year about the Torah. And uh, great, we have a good understanding of all five books of the Torah. Or we can talk all day long about the history of God's people and how God sets up kings and prophets and all these people. Fantastic. But if it doesn't transform you into a better person, a person that connects with people, salvages people, sees the good in people, then we have done nothing. We've done nothing. So it's very important for us to see these principles actualized in our lives. All right, so Proverbs 12. I'm gonna, the one I'm looking at is Proverbs 12, 21. It says, no harm overtakes the righteous, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. One of the things that you see in the Proverbs is these kind of sweeping, generic, positive statements. And I said last week, Proverbs is offset by the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Job, what is it about? It's a story about a guy who has everything. Everything has worked out for him. He has lots of kids. He has a happy family. They have a, abundance. Satan stands before Satan. You know, sometimes we think of this as a name. It's the Satan. It's the accuser. And he stands before the Lord, not as an equal. One of the things you'll see in the problem of good and evil, we tend to, in our heads, we tend to think of good and evil as being equals. And they are not. Nor are the ones who are responsible for good and evil. The accuser stands before the Lord and asks him for Job. He says, yeah, you built up a fence around the guy. Of course he praises you. Let me have him. And God says, okay. He's never going to curse me. He's never going to turn on me. And so say, the entire book is the result of Satan having his way with Job, taking everything away from him, stripping him down to this, you know, barely living human being like you see in the Holocaust. And... He never gives up on God. He is the example for all time of people who have been stripped to their essence and still saying, God is good. And I will praise him for whatever he blesses me with and whatever he takes away. It still all belonged to him. And so by the time you get to the end of the book, it's, it's hard to know how we consider it a wisdom book. It's just this guy who has had everything ripped away from him. And yet it's wisdom because it's a story about a guy who fears the Lord. And remember we talked about in Proverbs last week that the beginning of wisdom is what? Fearing God. You have to have a very healthy respect. Sometimes we, we don't want to use the word fear because modern Christians, we don't, we're, a, we're centered on the grace of God. Can I tell you that there is an abundance of scripture to tell you, to inform you, that there are penalties and they're bad. Sinful behavior, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as just saying, hey, I, you know, I believe in the grace of God. Yeah, well, you need to believe in the other side of it too because New Testament lines those two things up. And in Romans eleven twenty two, it takes the idea of the goodness and the severity, the kindness and the severity, the punishment of God, and it puts them together. And it says, how could both of these things exist in one being? Well, they better exist because otherwise there's no such thing as justice. We want mercy, but we want justice for everyone else. And they actually both exist in one person. So the book of Job is this long story about how justice is seemingly not served. And yet he fears the Lord. Here in Proverbs 12 verse 21, no harm overtakes the righteous, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. Would you just generically say that that statement is true? No harm overtakes the righteous? You understand where I'm leading? This isn't even true, is it? It's, it's not even true. It can't be true. I mean, you consider yourself righteous? Well, the Proverbs are full of these statements. And there's a couple of ways that you can divide that information out and understand them. And I think the way that makes the most sense is to understand that Proverbs is not talking about immediate consequence. Almost never is it talking about immediate consequence. Just like we talked about on Wednesday and last Sunday, I talked about it briefly, about the idea of life and death. When life and death are presented in the book of Proverbs, it's not talking about 
this life. It's not talking about this death. It's talking about spiritual, eternal life and death. And so now read this through the filter of something that is more eternal. No harm overtakes the righteous. That actually lines up with what we find in Romans 8. Neither wars, nor death, nor, it, nor angels, nor principalities. Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Right? All of that. Let me, let me turn, turn to Romans 8. We'll just look at one verse of that. Sorry, not having slides just really throws me. Okay, Romans 8, verse 28. Listen to this statement and see if you think that Paul, when he's writing Romans, has Proverbs 12 in his mind. So let me read Proverbs 12, 21 again. No harm overtakes the righteous, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. Romans 8, verse 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you think that's kind of the same statement? That what we're talking about isn't about the consequence in this life because nobody in their right mind is going to interpret Romans 8 28 and say yeah I'm never going to have any pain in this life I'm never going to have any hardship in this life because it doesn't matter how devout you are how pious you are before the Lord you're going to have struggle and in fact you might even say that the struggle doesn't even begin until you give yourself to the Lord that that's when things really start to heat up. Because once you say, I'm going to give myself to God, that's when Satan comes after you the most fierce. So Romans 8.28, you can't interpret that as, hey, I'm, I'm going to have everything handed to me in this life. That isn't what it's saying at all. It's just saying that things will work themselves out. God will work through you, and eventually everything is going to work out for those who are called according to his purpose. We'll line that up back with, with Proverbs 12, and you see that this has to be about uh, fate. It has to be about final outcomes. So God is supplying us in our testing. He's delivering us from it, and uh, he is actually sanctifying us through it. So the idea of sanctifying means to be consecrated to a purpose, to be set aside for a purpose. People of the world go through struggle just like we do. But when the people of the world go through struggle, it's purposeless. When, you, when God allows you or puts you through struggle, it is to change you. It is to transform you into what he wants you to be. So that's how he sanctifies you. He sets you aside uh, apart for his purpose by allowing you to endure. Now, any good parent would come to recognize this principle. If you save your kid from every struggle that happens to them, you have done them no favor. You've ruined them. You have to allow them to find purpose in the pain. You have to allow them to be shaped and taught by those problems that they face, the trials in their life. So skip on down a few verses, chapter 14 and verse 11. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Two words are being used here. Um, the idea of a house is what we would term a house. So when he says the house of the wicked, he is talking about a building. And he says the house of the wicked will be destroyed. So in other words, here are people who are wicked. They have a firm foundation. They have a house, and that house is going to be stripped away from them. And it can also, it doesn't have to be just the house. It can be the contents of the house or the results of the house. So the idea of having a name, this is where we live, it's our identity, all that stuff can be stripped away. When he says the tent of the upright, the, the word for tent here is only used to describe nomadic tents. So these aren't, it's not like, you know, the boys had camp a week ago. And they, they weren't, weren't enough, wasn't enough cabin space. And so they, we had to buy a tent for them to sleep outside in the soggy ground. And I can't tell you how thankful, how happy I was that they went to camp and uh, slept in a tent. Um, I'm just so glad that I didn't have to go. Um, we did. I counseled one year and I said, that's, I'm done. That's, 
I, I'm not an outdoorsy sorts of person. Anyway, so um, when he says the tent of the upright will flourish, he's talking about this nomadic tent. And nomadic tents were sort of bell-shaped. You know, they didn't just go straight up like a teepee. They, they kind of went across, and then they came down. It was covered with a few layers of, like, goat skin, sheep skin, stuff like that. And uh, they would set it up, and they would, they would stay at a place for a month until they, you know, their animals had basically eaten all the grass, and then they would move on to the next place. And that, that was a common thing among the Israelites for hundreds of years. That's what Abraham always lived in. That's what Isaac and Jacob, they always lived in nomadic tents. That's the word he's using here. And he's saying this, this idea of the wanderer and his house, is, is that it's not a place of permanence. And he says, here's the wicked living in this permanent dwelling, and it's all going to be wiped out. And here's a guy who's living in a nomad's tent, and it will flourish. Um, go over the next page. Um, this is Proverbs 28, and uh, chapter 28 and 29. On the top of page 629, there's, there are five statements that are actually used together. And one of the things I found interesting about this was, as I was just doing a little bit of reading on this, all of the Proverbs that are listed in this little segment at the top of page 629 are sort of bookend Proverbs. And so what happens in the middle of them is, is to explain the bookends. The bookends happen, and each one of these develops the theme for the next. So listen to them in order, which normally you would never do. Um, but in the Hebrew writing, these bookends are the main things that get underlined. And so if a rabbi is teaching on a subject, they can, they can say, Here, here's my point, and here's my point, and then here's all this other stuff that helps you understand the points, but here are the main points. So here's five main points right in a row. Uh, this is chapter 28, Proverbs 28 and verse 12. When the righteous triumph, there is great elation, but when the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. Now, depending on your political affiliation, you know, you could say that this, ha I mean, no matter what your affiliation, you could say this happens every four years, right? When somebody rises to power, a, gr a whole segment of society hides. And when another rises, then the other group hides. And, you know, uh, for a lot of people, what they do is they just sort of, uh, I, I'll ignore politics for this four years or eight years. I can't take it. I'm not watching the news, you know, whatever. And, th and that's kind of what's being said here, is that when somebody who rises up that we think is opposed to liberty, we think is opposed to righteousness, whew, I can't even take it. It's so ridiculous, I don't even want to hear it. And that's what he says. When the righteous triumph, there's great elation. And when the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. Now listen to how he develops the theme, because each one builds on the previous. So now he takes that last sentence and he uses it again in chapter 28 and verse 28. When the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. That's what he just said in chapter 28 and verse 12 at the end. Now he uses that to build the next statement. When the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. But when the wicked perish, the righteous thrive. Now he's going to take that last statement and he's going to build on it again in chapter 29 and verse 2. When the righteous thrive... The people rejoice. You see how it's pretty cyclical? When the wicked rule, the people groan. I'll get it. It's probably for me. Are you having the Bible read to you, Greg? <laughs> see what I was talking about, old people? You can't, you can't be trusted with tech. Rita, help. Is it still reading? <laughs> At least turn the volume down. Good gracious. We'll wait. Did he get it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't go to church with my dad, but I can just imagine that happening every Sunday and him not even hearing it until, you know, a chapter later. Okay. Um, <laughs> 29 verse 2, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to say that any better. The people groan, just oh my goodness, you know that. And and again, this isn't the place for politics, but it doesn't matter which side you're on on this. You experience that 
you experience that every four years or eight years, and it's horrible. You just go, how? How is this happening? But we're a nation of idiots. That's how it happens. <laughs> when the wicked thrive, this is chapter 29, verse 16. <clears throat> when the wicked thrive, so does sin. But when the righteous, uh, but the righteous will see their downfall. And then the last one is chapter 29, verse uh, 27. The righteous detest the dishonest. The wicked detest the upright. And so there's this, and, and here's the thing is, he's, he is, he's talking about government. He's talking about people rising to power. And he's talking about the problem of righteousness and wickedness within that landscape. And he's saying, it matters. It, the government affects us. And we don't like to be affected by it. I mean, especially America, especially, you know, that's who we are. The one thing I don't want is the government standing in my way, right? I mean, that's who we are. And the reality is that it has never not stood in the way. It has always been in the way of people. And yet God brings those governments into place. It is God who is responsible for those things. Because the government has to have some responsibility. It has to do some things. And, and here's the reality. When, when God's people, Israel, were sort of in their perfect formation, right at the foot of Mount Sinai, and, and God put, sets up all these governing laws over them. How long do, do you remember it took before they started forgetting about feeding the people who were poor? Or how long did it take for them to forget protect, to protect people who needed protection? It took no time at all. As soon as an enemy struck, it was every man for himself. And the point is that even when God sets up what could be perceived as the perfect nation, the perfect governance, God is our king. People can ignore that just as easily as they can anything else. Do you think that the children of Israel paid tithes, which was their tax? Do you think the, the children of Israel paid tithes all the way until the time of Christ? You're insane if you think that. Absolutely not. There was every loophole to get away around the tithe. Why do you think the law is so specific? The law is specific because God knew exactly what they were going to do. Walk away from the foot of Mount Sinai, well, by 10%. I, I'm going to study the word a little bit more, but I'm pretty sure what he was talking about was a tenth of 10. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to figure out how to get around it. We're good at that. We're good at weaseling out. And God set up all these protections for his people. And government still exists today. And it exists for God's purposes. So, you know, we have to be very careful with how we perceive it and how we speak of it because God has set it in place and it is for the protection, the advancement of people. Um, go down to the next, uh, the paragraph that talks about integrity and perversion. Uh, chapter 15, verse 26. I'm just going to pull one out of there. Chapter 15, verse 26. The Lord detests the thoughts of the wicked, but gracious words are pure in his sight. Um, the reason this one caught me was because the, it's not apples to apples comparison, is it? It's an apples to oranges. So when he says that he detests the thoughts of the wicked, so these people are just simply thinking something. And then it talks about gracious words being pure in his, uh, in his sight. That's acting on something that we're thinking. So how are these two things being compared? Because they are equal. And Jesus made that pretty plain, didn't he? Do you remember when Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount, the sayings on the Mount? Do you remember how he talks about adultery? I mean, to the Hebrews, adultery was adultery, right? It's the physical act of adultery, not to Jesus. Adultery was not just the physical act. Adultery was thinking it, lusting. That's weird, isn't it? I mean, to take, to take a law and pull it that far and say, it's, it's not just a matter of committing the act, it's actually thinking about it. And he talks about murder as being equal to what? Hatred. If you've said in your heart, I have no purpose for this guy. You call him a fool. 
fool, the, the word raka. I mean, he, he is worthless. You've committed murder. That's an odd thing to say, isn't it? So what Jesus does in his very first big dissertation to the people is he puts, he, he sort of fleshes out, he puts meat on the bones of these conceptual, the, what they thought were conceptual things. You know, it's okay, whatever I think. But, you know, I can't live that way. Well, actually, at the time of Jesus, there were people who believed that it also didn't matter how you lived. It mattered what you thought. And that was the only thing that mattered, right? So you have an entire segment of the population of Jesus' day saying that it doesn't matter what I say, it matters what I do, and another segment of the population saying the exact opposite. You know what Jesus is doing? He's saying they both matter. It matters what you think, and it matters what you do. And this goes back to Proverbs principles. The, the wisdom of Solomon isn't the wisdom of Solomon, right? It's the wisdom of whom? It's the wisdom of God. And for all time, God has said, it matters what you say, and it matters what you think. It matters what you do, and it matters what you believe. These things matter. They have bearing. In other words, the things that you think, you wind up saying. The things that you believe, you wind up doing. It matters. You have to be, give thought to these things. You have to pay attention to them. That's exactly why we talked about last week. What is wisdom? Well, whatever wisdom is, and we know that it's, it's from God, Solomon spends you know, a third of the book saying, pay attention. A third of the book telling his son, who he's writing all these things to, listen to me. I'll save you from hurt. But you got to listen to me. Go down to the next segment. And this is out of Proverbs 3, verses 33 through 35. It says, appropriate consequences is the subtitle here. So here again is another play on words about the concept of house. We saw that on the opposing page that you have the house and you have the nomad's tent. Listen to how it gets played here in Proverbs 3. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. So the word house here is just the normal Hebrew word for house, like it was in the one across the page. But when it says he blesses the home, I love to look these things up. So on, I have a Bible app, and when I look them up, I like to just go, okay, here are two things that are being compared. I want to know if they are actually, if it's an even comparison. So I have, for a dollar on my app, I was able to purchase all of the interlinear stuff. What that means is I can look up each Hebrew word or Greek word as it's used in the text, find out how it's used in other places in scripture, and just know, is this the same word when he says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home, is that the same word? It's not even remotely the same. You know the word that he uses for home? It's a sheep fold. That's all it is. It's a gate that you put around sheep. So why does that matter? Because what Proverbs does is it teaches through irony. And we don't see them because we don't speak Hebrew or Aramaic. We, we understand the language. But what it's, and, and if it was printed as sheepfold, we wouldn't get it. So you have to do a little bit of thinking. You have to do a little bit of research. So listen to it in the context of the sheepfold thing. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the sheepfold of the righteous. You may have nothing, and it may feel like there's no stability to it. There may, it may feel like there's, there's nothing to keep people from taking. But what he's saying is, God's hand is against the people who live in castles. And God's hand is for the people who live in a sheepfold. That's what he's saying. Does that mean that it's realized in this life? It doesn't. And Proverbs, no matter how glorious a picture it paints of the righteous, it's not talking about the payoff in this life. It never is. It's 
but it's telling you, Solomon is telling his sons, listen to what I'm saying, because it does pay off. It does matter. It has eternal consequence. He goes on, he says, he mocks proud mockers. So another irony is presented. So what God is doing is your translation, some translations will say he scorns the scorners. And the idea is that he uses the thing that people, that the proud do to other people who they don't care about. He uses that against them. He mocks the mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The wise inherit honor. So the idea of inheritance means you don't inherit something that you're not entitled to, right? You don't inherit something that you're not related to. So inheritance speaks of a relationship between a father and a son, a mother and a daughter. So listen to that phrase again. The wise inherit honor. The people who are wise are choosing the wisdom of God. They inherit honor. Honor is used again later, but, and it says, but fools uh, get only shame. Flip the page over here to 630. <coughs> this is chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. I underlined this because of these two phrases in verse 30. The tree of life. Anytime the tree of life is mentioned in scripture, I always want to know what, what is it talking about? In this case, it is referencing, it is, when, you, when scripture talks about the tree of life, it's using the phrase intentionally. The tree of life is from the Garden of Eden. So why is it using the tree of life? Well, do you remember that the tree of life was the way that, whether it's you know, to be understood literal or figurative, the tree of life was the way that Adam and Eve access immortality and that when God takes them away from the garden because they ate of the other tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they no longer have access to that tree what winds up happening their days are numbered that's what that's the curse of that that they would die they would go back to the earth so listen to chapter 11 and verse 30 the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and the one who is wise saves lives. So, you know, I kind of think of this as the life that we live in front of other people. I don't mean the life that we fake live in front of other I'm not talking about how we present ourselves to other people. I'm talking about the real life that people who know us see. The real life, if we belong to God, it, it is a tree of life to other people. It, it saves lives. It produces. And here's one of the things that's interesting about this. The phrase that says he, uh, the, um, the one who is wise saves lives. Actually, the phrase is exactly the opposite of that. It doesn't say saves lives. The, the Hebrew says takes lives. And 100% of the time in the Hebrew text, that is a negative phrase and it means to kill. So how do you line this up? If that phrase always throughout scripture in every context means that the person kills someone else, it takes the life of someone else. So let me read it to you that way. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and the one who is wise takes lives. How do they kill? Well, it's again, eternal consequence. He is stripping that person from the ways of the world. He's, he is saving life. What, what the translators have done is they've put in what they think it means. They've given you the interpretation, which they're not supposed to do. But in this case, most of the time, you know, you, you don't put in what you believe it means. But in this case, they're stating it that way. What we think he means is that they save lives. So your life being one of, you know, a tree of life to other people, other people admire it. They are on the path of life. They're choosing the wrong things and they see what you're presenting to them and they stop the course that they've set for themselves and they stop and then it produces life for them. That's what the vast majority of people believe this means. So here's the thing is, this lines up with other parts of scripture if that's true. 
Because when Jesus, in the same Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that he says is that you are the salt of the earth. And we have always said that the salt of the earth is talking about some preservative power. Sure, it does do that, but salt also produces thirst. And one of the things that we as believers are supposed to do is we're supposed to make other people want what we have. Not in a material sense. But my life is full. I'm comp- I don't have to be happy, go lucky. I'm joyful, which means at peace. It means contented. We live in a world that's full of just this fakeness. And social media just exacerbates the problem. You know, you see pictures of people who are just smiling and having fun. Well, it must mean that they're joyful. No, it doesn't. In fact, probably they aren't. Most people aren't. But you see somebody who's not laughing and not smiling. Well, they must be miserable. No, not at all. I'm completely content with where I am in the Lord. And what other people want in life is not fakeness. We think that what we see in other people's lives is, oh, well, if I could just be that happy all the time, yeah, you'd be miserable too. What you need is joy. Being at peace with God. Knowing that your life has value and meaning before him. I don't care if other people understand my life. I don't care at all. I do care if God understands it, if God has purpose for it. And so what this is doing is it's setting up this idea that our lives are supposed to be deeper than what they often are. Maybe that shows itself in happiness, but often it doesn't. Often it just shows itself in contentment saying that what God has given to me, that's all I need. Go down to chapter 26 and verse 1, towards the end of that same heading, it says, like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. Snow in summer. I mean, you know, I don't, I've don't. i lived in the pretty far north, and I don't remember snow in summer. I remember several feet of snow in April. You know, I remember uh, the blizzard, the one blizzard we had in 1978. It was like the drifts were nine and 10 feet tall. It went over our house and we built tunnels through the yard, but it wasn't in the summer. There's an inappropriateness to this. And that's what Proverbs does this a lot. It sets up this idea of something that's inappropriate. Something doesn't make sense. It's sort of like when you see videos of people who are walking around with lions you know, and there's a video of a guy who's got his phone set up and the lion's behind the trees stalking him, but the lion's his friend. I just have to think that at one point, the lion's not going to be your friend. At one point, you're going to be a turkey sandwich. And, you know, I don't know. It just seems very unnatural to me. That's just my observation. You may think, oh, it's wonderful. God's creatures are all playing together. Yeah, actually, that's presented um, as an irony right? In scripture, that's presented as the impossible for a reason. Lions don't hang out with cute little lambs. And so, you know, these people walk around with tigers and taming them and, you know, living among them. I just, I don't know. All I can think of is the recording of the guy who lived with the grizzlies, the last recording of that guy. That didn't end very well. Um, So it's fine. You know, have a grizzly cub if you want to. Um, but this is what this is doing is it's presenting these ideas as um, impossible. So snow, or maybe not impossible, but not a good idea. Snow in the summer. And then the other one, which you all would understand if you farm, is the rain and the harvest. What would the rain and the harvest do? It'd ruin a bunch of stuff, wouldn't it? So what he's saying is these things don't work together. They either shouldn't work together or they don't work together. And he compares that to what? Honor for a fool. Don't lift these people up into positions of authority. Don't lift them up as role models. They aren't. And it doesn't take very, you don't have to look very far to see how uh, our society is bent on this one. We lift up all kinds of people as role models. 
that should not be role models. They should not be role models. And here's the thing is that we as a group of believers have to be very careful about who we esteem. And, you know, I'm not interested in television for a reason. If, if you're putting that stuff in front of your face every day, it's having effect. Find something else to do. Um, there are very few things, and now you can't watch public television, especially in the month of June. So there's all kinds of stuff that's just being presented as normal to you and your family. Find something else to do. Sit and read scripture. Watch a, a movie that, you know, doesn't have an agenda. Yeah, I don't think there are any of those, but, you know, find something else to do. Maybe be productive. Learn a hobby. Do something. Um, so <clears throat> the idea of a fool being honored, you can laugh at that and you can say, we would never honor a fool. Um, we live in America. So, yes, we do. Okay, <clears throat> down at the end of that page, it says, um, chapter 15, verse 11, death and destruction lie open before the Lord. Death and destruction here are two separate words. It's Sheol and Abaddon, and you hear those terms used together through Scripture. And can I tell you something? Um, nobody actually knows what those things are. So Sheol, most people think that that's talking about the grave. It's the place where, so Sheol is described in Scripture as being where good people and bad people are but they're dead. They're in another place. And Abaddon seems to be the destruction of the bad people. The debate will rage forever until the Lord comes again as to what these two things are. We don't really understand them. There are about five or six major words that are used to describe uh, death, uh, destruction, hell, consequence, all of those things. And the way we define them, it, it, what it tells me is we don't know. We just simply don't know. And we build a lot of assumptions based on what we see around us. So our understanding of heaven is typically based on, you know, so John uses the language of houses and, and city, cities paved with gold and, and the sea of glass and stuff. I, you know, I don't think he knew how to describe what he saw. He had no idea. So he, all he, had to, he could take 15 dimension words and, and try to put them in one dimension. How do you do that? He said, I, I saw things that were indescribable. I, I don't think that's just true of the positive afterlife. It's true of the judgment and the negative. We just don't have any idea what these things are. But I can tell you one thing we do know is that Scripture plainly says there is a division of people. And that, that God will judge. Ultimately, he will judge people for not just things that they thought, but what they did. Remember the lion of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25? You know what's significant about the lion of the sheep and goats? It's all stuff that we kind of don't do. You know, bringing a cup of cold water to somebody who's thirsty, going to visit people in prison, taking care of people who are sick. We think church is about whether we, you know, I checked off the list, I was there Sunday morning. Good. That's not in the list in Matthew 25. You know what's in the list? Taking care of people who are needing your help. It's interesting how we've just prioritized going to church. I don't see that. I don't see it. There's, there's one passage that talks about not forsaking the assembly in Hebrews 10, but I don't see the prioritization that we've placed on it. Should it be a priority? Absolutely, but not to the detriment of everything else. And in fact, in that same Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus does is he talks about when you're on the way to be with your brethren, and you realize you have something against somebody else, you better take care of that first. So you find actually all kinds of places that say that we should uh, defer that to other things. <clears throat> he says right below that 16, chapter 16, verse 2, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Um, this this uh, word for motive is actually just the word for spirits. And so there's an irony being presented here that motives are something that are spirits. And he says they're being weighed. Do you hear the irony? How can you take something that is a spirit and try to weigh it? Try to say that it is of a certain 
density. And that's what he's presenting, is that it doesn't make sense. So the motives are weighed by the Lord. Now, if you go over to the next page, and this is chapter 21 and verse 2, he says basically the same thing. <clears throat> 21 verse 2, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. That's the same word for motives. The, the Lord weighs, sometimes it'll translate, the Lord weighs the spirit, weighs the spirits. So I think the main thing from this isn't even about that. It's just an interesting irony that's presented here. The main thing is that we kind of judge ourselves as being correct. Everything you think is exactly right. <laughs> that's what you really want to hear this morning, isn't it? I mean, but that's that's kind of how we are, is we kind of we kind of think that, you know, I think that guy's a jerk, so he must be. That's a hundred percent truth coming straight from my mouth, you know? And that's that's sort of how we present everything, is that if I think it, it must be true. And all throughout the Proverbs, Solomon is telling his son, Don't be an idiot. <laughs> you um Stuff you think isn't true. Don't fall for it. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is death. All these statements, they're saying the same thing. The idea is that you tend, and I tend to sort of justify the things that we believe. You better line that up with what you believe to be God's word. Be very careful. Uh, Skip down here to chapter 21, verse 3, under false worship. It says, to do what is right and just is more accept acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Does that sound like a statement of Micah? Or the statement that I just talked about from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? There's, there's something more important, than more important than sacrifice? Sacrifice is all there is to the Hebrews. It's all about getting your animals in line. Oh, I got to go up to the, today's my day to go and bring my... Bring the animals up, they sacrifice them. Done for this week or this month or whatever. There's something bigger and more important than sacrifice? Yeah. It's more acceptable. Doing right, doing what is right and just. I'm going to skip because we're out of time here. Let me, let's go over to the next page, 632, and I'll wrap up here under, uh, this is Proverbs 3. I'm going to read Proverbs 3, 3 and 4, and then I'm going to go to Proverbs 16. Um, <clears throat> this is on page 632, if you have your daily Bible. It's under the love and faithfulness heading. So, he says in Proverbs 3, 3 and 4, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets, tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. So again, there's that kind of sweeping statement, um, you know, that you're going to find favor in the sight of God and man. Maybe and maybe not. You will find favor in the sight of God. And in a real sense, men will honor you. They'll respect you because you don't let love and faithfulness go. So love and faithfulness. Love here is that, remember the Hebrew word hesed that we've talked about before? Hesed is when you read in the Psalms and it would say God's unfailing love, or it would say his steadfast love. That's the Hebrew word hesed. It's one of maybe five major words that are used. It's if you were going to pick five words in the Hebrew that you needed to know what they are, hesed is one of them. It's probably the main one. And his said is the word that's used throughout Scripture to describe God as a covenant partner. And then it's used to describe what people should be as covenant partners. It doesn't actually get used to describe people, but God's desire for people. So he says, let love, or has said, steadfast love, let love and faithfulness. Now, this is an, a, um, a misinterpretation. Faithfulness, the word faithfulness here, it can be faithfulness, but it's that's not the normal usage of this word. The normal usage of the word is the word for truth. So I'll just think about this. Let's back up and we'll reread this sentence with two understandings, hopefully. Steadfast love and truth. He says, let 
Steadfast love and truth never leave you. Truth is that important? Uh, apparently so. And that's why I started with the idea of the woke culture thing and the eradication of um, the Holocaust. I'll get it. It's for me. Is that you, Amy? Oh, my goodness. I love when people's phones go off at church. It, I'll get it. Um, so the idea of the Holocaust and sort of eradicating that, erasing it from history, it's the elimination of what is actually truth. We can't accept truth or we don't want to hear about truth. But here is something that is, has actually happened. And what we're saying is, let's, let's never look at that again. It's an important thing for us to understand because you can't eliminate truth. Truth is what it is. And when Solomon tells his son, don't ever stop being a faithful, covenant, loving person. Don't ever stop that. And don't ever ignore truth. It doesn't make any difference how much it goes against you or how much you dislike it. It is truth. And that's it. And you know what? The reality is, and why I tell the story about the woke culture is, None of us like 100% of the truth. Isn't that exactly right? You might listen to part of the truth, but you don't want to hear the whole thing. That's why we like Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith doesn't present the whole truth. In fact, he never does. He works around it and makes people feel better. And we like that. Because we can't handle the truth, as somebody famous once said. <laughs> the reality is that truth, we better pay attention to it. We better understand it. Because it is our reality. And at some point, it's going to define us. It may not define us now, because we may be able to evade it through our lives. But when you hit the final curtain, truth is going to hit you square in the face. You better pay attention to it. Let me look at this last verse. Here it is, chapter 16 and verse 6, the one right underneath it. You can get your little communion cup going because this is what we're going to use for our communion, and then we'll close out. I don't think that I've read another proverb that I thought had more... Um, messianic quality to it than this one. If you're going to underline something and then just simply put out to the side, like, you know, sometimes I highlight things with color because, you know, certain things, things pertaining to Christ, I tend to use yellow uh, because thinking about the light, things pertaining to sacrifice, I'd use pink or red or, you know, so you use uh, green for things that talk about creation or whatever. So if you were going to highlight something in your Bible, and you were going to put like, you know, big lines around it to show that it's glowing. Listen to this. This is Proverbs 16, or yeah, 16 and verse 6. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Now again, those are the same two words we just talked about. Through hesed, the loving kindness, the, the everlasting loving kindness of God. And faithfulness, which is actually the word for truth. So through loving kindness and truth, sin is atoned for. The word <clears throat> that is used here is actually the word from Leviticus that talks about atonement. Atonement, the sacrifices of the Old Testament to atone for sin. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. That is the definition of Christ. That is clearly about Jesus. Now, you could say that it is about Old Testament, you know, sacrifices for them. It may be, but it doesn't find its real fulfillment until Jesus. And he says, through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. So the Mosaic sacrificial system by which sin is atoned for, it's an expression of God's hesed, of God's truth. Have you ever thought about it that way? 
that the sacrificial system that we sort of mock, and I'm not going to read Leviticus, it's boring. That it's an expression of God's faithfulness. It's an expression of God's truth. In other words, there's, there's no way to avoid sacrifice. The Israelites were commanded to do that because it would atone for sin. Did it atone for sin? No. Why? We talk about this all the time. This is, these are important concepts. It doesn't atone for sin because of at least two reasons. One, the animal is not perfect. And not talking about, now they had to have an animal that was without blemish. But we're talking about spiritually. The animal was not without blemish. So it couldn't. But secondly, and more importantly, the animal never volunteered for the role. I want you to hear how important that is. Because when you eat this little meal like the Hebrews did, they ate the meal, the, the body and the blood of the sacrifice. They ate that to remember the one who took their place. They were eating and drinking to an animal that never volunteered, nor was it perfect. But when you eat and you drink, what you're remembering is someone who, he wasn't like me, and he wasn't like you. He wasn't imperfect. He was the guy who embodied love and compassion. Who's your biggest hero? He was way beyond any of them. And yet, in the presence of everyone, he said, I'll take your place. For something that he never deserved, he took it. He volunteered for it. So when you eat and drink, you remember the one who gave himself, gave you the gift, gave himself for sin for all mankind of all time. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the body of Jesus that took the punishment. He endured all of that cruelty for us on the cross. And we pray that our lives will be more full, that we will remember the blessings that we have through Jesus. Amen. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, which was the atonement for our sins. And help us to live our lives as atoned people, people who have already been forgiven of sin. Help us to live redeemed lives in Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, happy Father's Day. Um, I didn't really have a Father's Day lesson of mine. I figured the, the Proverbs of a, of a good dad telling his son what he should do is better advice or um, better than what, you know, ever I could offer. That's how um, Proverbs is presented. It's presented as the fatherly advice of a dad uh, to his son. Um, and a lot of times that advice can go too far. Uh, where we think that it is the word of God. In this case, it absolutely is. It's the wisdom of God. So if you're going to tell your son something that he should do or your daughter something they should do, find it in the Proverbs first and uh, give that advice to him. Um, there's lots of stuff we have yet to see about um, how we live our personal lives, how we interact with people, how we interact with God, and even how we can uh, understand uh, ourselves. So... Uh, we got to be out of here in 15 minutes. The Presbyterians are going to come in here and rock it out. Actually, um, they don't, this isn't their stuff. There's a, there's a Hispanic group that comes in here and like plays at about 100 decibels uh, after lunch. So I don't know. Um, I think it's an interesting thing that here we are first. We're a pretty quiet little group. I don't even, I don't remember hearing the word amen today, except in a prayer. Presbyterians are probably, you know, there might be an amen. But I guarantee that Hispanic group is going to have a lot of that. So, um, okay, let me stop this.